speaks the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you back to episode number 75, where today we have a special guest, Dr. Charles Rakoff, Professor Emeritus of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. So very excited for today's conversation. Kind of we're going to be going into a little bit into cryptography, security, privacy. I believe, Dr. Rakoff, you teach a, uh, a graduate level course in some field of cryptography, correct? Uh, Yes. Beautiful, beautiful. So maybe you just want to say a quick hi to our listeners. Hello, listeners. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So that's Dr. Charles Rakoff for you. So very excited. But before we get into the podcast... We have some quick news as we do every single episode. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for 12,800 followers now on spotify uh youtube has been growing a lot we're already now at 1600 subscribers so we grew like 600 in like one or two weeks yeah yeah that was pretty impressive um and also google play is still doing great you know i think like i think it's like 2200 around there so yeah if you're listening to this podcast right now make sure to hit the follow button And also, uh, come watch us on YouTube for the video version, where you can come subscribe, like the video and all that stuff. And also, leave a comment. Why, Ray? Why would you want to leave a comment (laughs) so you can be the comment of the week? So, usually, as you know, we have the comment of the week segment, uh, either got from YouTube comments. And I think we're also doing, we also do emails. We're also okay with certain messages on Instagram, because I know we get some beautiful Beautiful message by you guys. So this particular comment of the week is actually another email that we have from Anna Marie. Now, this is a wonderful email. It sounds it sounds like I'm bragging if I say this, though. But this is what, this is what Anna Marie is saying. You guys are awesome. I truly am listening to two geniuses that are so excited by the true language of the universe. You sound like a young Plato and Achilles together. The quality is amazing and the enthusiasm is killer. And then she just talks about, you know, how she listened to the podcast. You deserve to be on an official talk show, stuff like wow. that. So very, very, very nice words. Thank you so much, Anna Marie. Thank you. She for also says, you have my love and support. Have a great life. Thank you so much for that <laughs> wonderful comment. Hopefully yeah. you're listening to this where you became the comment of the week. So, awesome. yeah. Also, last very thing simple. I forgot to mention, we actually yesterday we hit 200,000 total downloads. So thank you, oh, everybody who's been listening to the podcast. Nice. We um, didn't even post that. No, we didn't. No, we I didn't. Think, I think we're going to post 250. 250. So like we're going to post 250. Quarter million. You know, that's that's the big number. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that's a big I guess, number. I guess that's yeah. everything, Ray. I think that's everything. I think we can safely get into it. So as all of our listeners know here, uh, we have... A classic way of starting these podcasts with all of our guests on here, Dr. Rakoff, the classic question. So how did you get into your respective field? So I guess computer science, cryptography, what what kind of initially intrigued you? Well, <clears throat> uh, I was intrigued by to, to go into computer science so that they wouldn't kill me. Uh, I, w- I was in my... Uh, Undergraduate at MIT, and okay. uh, in an undergraduate math program, and I had a deferment from the draft when Vietnam War was on at the time, and I was told if I can combine my undergraduate program with a master's program, then I could get another year of deferment. And I didn't think I could get into MIT in graduate school in math, but I thought I could in computer science. Mm-hmm. So I basically went into computer science as a graduate student to to save my life because I don't think I would have been a very good soldier. Wow. So so that's that was a really good decision. As it turns out I could have had I wound up with a good lottery number after that so I wouldn't have been drafted anyway, but the decision had already been made at that point. So that's why I went into computer science so I could get into a fifth year of undergraduate graduate school and not get drafted. Mhm. So did you study computer science? 
before you officially decided to go into it? Yeah, I mean, some programming, some theory. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was. It, it wasn't a department. Okay. Now it's a combined department: electrical engineering and computer science. Then it was just electrical engineering, but mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I was interested as an undergraduate. So was there a lot of the math that we see? I'm I'm assuming it still would be right, like a lot of the math heavy computer science, or would it be a lot on the engineering heavy? Uh, well, I would say the kind of big big things then you know non computability and and things like that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say very heavy math, but not heavy engineering either, really. Okay. Mm. So kind of like it was forming its own new field at that point. Yeah, I, in time. I would think, yeah, theory was forming its its own f- yeah. field at that point. It was just before NP completeness and that sort of thing became very important. Mm. Oh, and did you and did you enjoy computer science? Yeah, so I went or became you... um, I went to a master's program and then a PhD program, but uh, but yeah, uh, I mean I'm glad I did, but my original motivation was just it was a convenient way of staying alive. Uh, so mm. It was just a simple decision. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's uh, no. I mean, given that decision, I, I, I can, I can definitely see the circumstances. Just when the initial statement was, "Oh, I did it to save my life," I'm like, "What?" Yeah, <laughs> just, was, just pure cowardice. Yeah, that's, that's wow. No, pure I cowardice. mean, in the in in that particular situation, I can see it, especially continuing on the line of academia that you are. You yeah. know, I can totally see where it leads you here. So that's, I'm probably not the only person to choose a of course. Uh, a, a academic path for dra- for reasons relating to the draft at the time. Mm-hmm. Of course, I mean I can guarantee it. There's no way, right? Yeah. And so during your undergrad slash graduate uh, time, what was the fa- your favorite course that you've ever taken? Oh, long time. Or maybe if if you can't pick, maybe maybe a a, a couple top three. Uh, yeah. I, I guess I enjoyed automata theory. I don't know. That was a big area at the time. Now it's not so much of an area. Sorry, uh, sorry, atomic theory? Aut- automata theory. What would that? So what is what is that? Uh, well, formal theory of machines, uh, finite state oh. machines, push down automata. Oh, automata, like automated. Yeah. Oh, okay, mm. okay. That's where that. Works. Okay, okay, okay. It should Understood. be called automaton theory, like machine theory. We don't say machines theory. Mm-hmm. It should be automata Automatized theory, is m- but it's called plural. automata theory. Okay, so it doesn't really make it. <laughs> so back then, that was that was one a year, and that was what? What was that? What were the characteristics mainly of that course? Was it? I guess it was logical, mathematical, not very hard. Mm. Okay, and that was a graduate level. Course? That was undergraduate, I think. Undergraduate. Oh, okay. Undergra- Did you ever take any? Because this is a math and physics podcast. Did you take any physics courses in your? I undergrad, took two graduate years of level? physics. Okay. Okay. And uh, I uh, didn't do anything quantum related. We we did electromagnetic theory. Mm-hmm. I guess I like special relativity because I found it incredibly easy. Wow. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, it's just a few equations. You apply them consistently in the same way every time. It's it's as theory. It's so limited. It only handles. Fra- fixed, you know, constant mm. frames of reference, yeah. constant velocity frames of reference. It, right, inertial it, it's frames. It's a very, very, very limited uh, setting, and within that setting, there are these equations which tell you everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, I kind of like that. That 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 was so easy. It really, it really is easy. I'm not not making that up. No, for sure. Um, you can definitely derive uh, with like very easy like situations. Just you assume the speed of light is constant in all frames, and then all the equations kind of fall out. They fall. From... And even if you don't know how to derive them, you just remember them. I mean, yeah. they just are like two or three. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then there are these paradoxes, these barn door paradoxes, if you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. And you have to resolve those paradoxes. And it's the resolution is different frames see things happening in different order. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just. It's very easy to do these calculations. Mm-hmm. And so, so when that's did you... one thing I remember. That is one of the easiest parts of physics was the special relativity. It's, uh... And so did you start your undergrad doing physics and math and then went into math only and then computer science? I did. A, I got a math undergraduate. Uh, certainly I found the advanced math course is the most difficult. Right. Uh, and... Uh, 
Um, but uh, Bonnie took two, two years of physics and uh, never felt I really got into that very deeply. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I never did learn what Hamiltonians and Lagranges and stuff like that are. Right, right. More than that. Uh, I think I think I'm about to get into that this year. <laughs> the classical uh, mechanics. Cla- yeah, cla- classical. Mm-hmm. So a, a, a little more intrigued in the theory behind a lot of it rather than the, uh, you know what well, I mean? Because I'm, I'm assuming yeah, that well, the theory, theory of science, the, especially these days, physics is difficult, but that particular theory is, I think, quite simple. Yes. For special relativity. Special, yes. Okay. Well, that's an understandable way of thinking about it, right? So, in 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 your computer science, well, I mean, you obviously went on to PhD, uh, to like you know, to go into that field in computer science. What were in that day, in that time, what was the difference in computer science than you see today? Because I think if there's one field in the last fifty years that has mm-hmm. advanced the most, it would be computer science. Right? So, so what, uh, what's the difference like? One interesting thing in theory is stuff that people were interested in then nobody even knows about or studies or cares about today, mm. including the work I did my, my PhD thesis can we, in. Can I get uh, an example of that? Because I'm just uh, wondering, like, just the pinpoint. So, for example, uh, here's something I often, something false that I often see theoreticians say that we have no uh, explicit examples of functions that require exponential time to compute, where no natural examples of languages where membership requires exponential time to compute. And the fact is there are lots and lots of examples. People just forget about them. Uh, and it's that work with my advisor, Albert Meyer, that, that I was working on at the time, proving that certain languages have require a, a lot of time to compute. What we can't do most of the time is get the computational complexity right to within an exponential. We mm. tend to be off by an exponential. So there are plenty of languages I can prove require exponential time to compute, but the problem is they probably really require double exponential time. There are languages I can prove require double exponential time to compute, but they probably really require triple exponential time. Mm. So we're just off by an exponential. That's one thing people don't talk about very much examples of these languages. They come from logical theories. The uh, first order, uh, the, the first, uh, the second order theory of one successor, for example. Uh, they, they come from mathematical logic. Another thing people used to talk about a lot are various types proving certain results about special types of Turing machines. For example, can, in what sense can we prove that a, two, a, a Turing machine with two-dimensional tapes cannot simulate well a Turing machine with one-dimensional t- tapes? Things like that. Interesting. Or, or Turing okay. machines where tapes have many heads versus one head. Thing, things like that are just subjects that nobody cares about now. And this is within theory itself. But I mm. think, if I may, and I think this could be, that it's advanced to such a degree at this point that people completely forego the basic fundamentals, right? Because people are immediately thrown into program hello world. They're not taught how that hello world is actually programmed in the first place and what it takes when you type in the words print hello world or whatever, right? So I guess could that maybe be a reason because it was so fundamental back in the day there's just a lot more to learn about the fundamentals. And One of the interesting things about the yeah. theory, the basic theory, the basic open questions of computational complexity, such as is, are, is P equal NP, are there one-way functions, there has been zero progress since 1970s. Mm-hmm. Zero. Absolutely zero. Minus 273 degrees centigrade or whatever. Zero progress <laughs> in that what we have made progress in in theory is using assumptions to do more and more interesting things, particularly in cryptography. So we can use assumptions to do more and more interesting things. But as far as the validity of those assumptions, no progress whatsoever. Hmm. So you're more interested, I think, in, in, this, in program, issues involved programming. And I will say this, people no longer believe the things we were constantly being told. When I was young, we were told in programming languages that declarations are very, very important. And it's very important to have declarations and it's a very rich thing. That now mm. we're taught, ah, Python's perfectly good. You don't need declarations. I was just, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so the practical people 
don't seem at all concerned about the fact that that uh, that they change their minds all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And I find that I find the practical stuff there very frustrating because there, do, there doesn't seem to be any constancy or or anything. There's just things keep changing. Mm -hmm. Well, they just uh, do whatever is convenient, right? Whatever mm -hmm. works. Well, it's it's that's the trouble. Is is it, it, do you really? Yeah, of course. If you don't have to declare stuff, that's one less statement, mm -hmm. and so you can write your program more quickly. But surely we're concerned about your programs being correct and right mm -hmm. and everything. And I would think we need even more declarations. This is my field, of course. More types of declarations. You need very, for example, units. You you want to know about what units things are in. So especially for a physicist, let's say you're writing a program mm -hmm. and you have all sorts of different things. You would want, you can tell me if this exists, by the way, if you know, you would want the syntax to check your units. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if, you, if you have, you define the gravitational constant in certain units and if you have a, and if, and if you have a, a force is G M one M two over R squared and, uh, You'd want that to come out to the correct units, right. and the syntax of your language should check that your units are correct. Right. Um. I I don't know if that's actually being done, but I know that there are packages in Python that do keep track of your units. So you just you you assign units to some of your some of your constants and and variables, and you can do the calculations, and then at the end you ask, okay, what are the units of of my answer and it'll give you the unit so you can check uh, to see if it makes sense and if, or if you made a mistake somewhere. Yeah. So I'm, I'm asking that that be done all automatically. Right. And not only units in that sense, but also units, you know, we're talking about metric or, or imperial units. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long mm -hmm. ago where mistakes were made that way. And yeah, because yeah, I'm pretty sure <laughs> with very, the, the rocket. Very costly. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty uh, sure with the, with the Python code, if you have a kilogram and a pound, I don't think it'll understand. I think it'll just have kilogram pound like i don't think it'll understand it so i get i get your point yeah there like that uh, and i know you were mentioning a little bit of p versus np and talking about that whole relationship do you want to quickly grow like go by that do you think it's a quick enough topic because well, we did actually have an episode where i spoke about p versus np and so I know you spoke about it, so I just want to see your take on it. So the, the issue is how quickly can we compute things? How efficiently can we compute things? And so there are a number of things which appear difficult to compute. Uh, <clears throat> one example, uh, I'm trying to think what the m nicest example. People talk about the traveling salesman problem. You have a, a graph with distances between nodes, and you want to visit all the nodes mm -hmm. as efficiently as possible. And you want to know what's the best way of doing that. Can that be done efficiently or not? And there are a bunch of problems of that nature, and we can prove they're all equivalent. That is, I can do one efficiently if only if I can do the other ones efficiently. Mm -hmm. And and what P equals NP means they can be done efficiently intuitively. I mean, I'm simplifying a lot. And if they can't be, then they can't be done efficiently. And mm -hmm. uh, if P does equal NP efficiently in an efficient sense, then all of the cryptography in use today and in the future will be broke, can be broken. So oh. it's very important for for cryptography. And that's why none of the crypto we talk about, except for certain trivial things such as one-time pad, which I won't get into, none of the crypto we talk about uh, can be proven secure because it's possible because we can't prove that P is not equal to NP. And if P is equal to NP, then it's all insecure. If people, if P is not equal to NP, it may or may not be secure. Mm -hmm. That requires something more. It requires one-way functions. But the fact is we can't prove any of this stuff we're talking about is secure right so i want to talk about a whole bunch of stuff people do when they do encrypt when they use encryption people use encryption all the time and all the stuff can be broken possibly so it's a really big deal that we don't know of anything that can be broken mm -hmm. and so uh how much i i pose a question we, we make certain assumptions that all this cryptography is correct and how much money, what are we betting on when we make those assumptions? How much money are we talking about? And my theory is we're talking about basically all of it. <laughs> all, all the money in the world. 
basically. I mean, some people have some stuff in a mattress or something, but basically we're betting all the money in the world that this stuff is secure. It, it's a rather big bet based on an extraordinary amount of ignorance. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so that's why it's important. Yeah. And just for the listeners, the, the, is, it, is it P versus NP? That's what it's called? Well, the question is whether P equals NP. Right. So that, that is actually a Millennium Prize problem. Yeah. And, so uh, if you, if you're, you can make a lot more than that by trying to steal all the money in the world. Yeah. But that <laughs> has difficulties associated with it if you've ever watched a movie. Uh, a safer way is just by taking the million dollars yeah. <laughs> uh, from this. Uh, co- the name of the company is uh, It's based in Boston or was. What's the name of the company that's offering a oh. million dollars? We we actually did an episode oh, oh, the on all the prize problems, problems. Oh, um, and I it's, we have forget. we know this, we know this. I forgot this. I forget the name of the company. Yeah, no, no. I mean, there, it There's some institute. We, I swear we have it here. And one of them, the the Poincaré proving the Poincaré conjecture. One of them can be was one, but the person refused to uh, accept the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we spoke yeah, about that. He has some that was so strange funny. principles. I don't know what his principles are, but those are very strange principles, mm-hmm. if you ask me. So it's actually called uh, the Clay Math Clay Institute. Math Institute. Clay Institute. Yeah. Clay, yep, yep. That's the one. That's the one. For sure. Yeah, so yeah, 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 we should uh, get into the, the actual cryptography part of the episode. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to definitely get into that. <laughs> yeah. Because just, just, just a general question, like, I think this is completely your field to go ham. Like, so what is cryptography and like, why do we need it? What are the uses and applications for it in today's world, especially with everyone heavily depending on these devices and these computers? What is it and why is it important? So in terms of why is it important, I mean, you're, you're, if you do online banking, I'm afraid of it, but if you do online banking, you're also betting all your money on it. So, mm-hmm. so if you ask how is important is it to you, you just look at the money in your bank account. That's, that's how wow. important it is to you. Uh, so I like to, to talk about the ways people use cryptography by just telling a little story. Uh, you come home one day, you, you have a, a wireless network in your home. So you come home and you take your phone out of your pocket and you maybe uh, send something to a printer and you uh, maybe upload or download stuff from some home computers that are on the network. And then you go to your uh, bank's website or app and you do some banking. And you use a huge amount of cryptography in doing that. And uh, there are, in particular, there are three different algorithms you used, and uh, and those algorithms have certain security requirements. And if you like, I can talk about what those security algorithms are. For sure. But uh, but you've certainly used a lot of cryptography there. And there are other things people use cryptography for. I, I think what what I, that's that story I just described takes into account at the moment most of it. In the future, there may be lots of other things. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, the things I'm talking about also involve are used in blockchain, although not everybody does blockchain stuff. But everybody does the things I just described. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and so, what's going on there? So we can talk about that if you want. But, but I, I think it's an, a nice thing because we're all using it all the time. Uh, the uh, so at the core of all of this. I think is something called a secure session protocol, okay. which so so here here's this doesn't have directly to do with what I just talked about, but it mm. it is there, but it's hidden. Uh, <clears throat> if you and I want to uh, are together right now, but we want to have a conversation over the internet in a few days, so we might set together get together, flip some coins, and choose a long random key, and then. When we're apart, we'll use that random key to have the secure conversation over the internet. And I call that a secure uh, session protocol. Okay. And that's part of what the, this the uh, standard called TLS. But it's a, I call it a secure session protocol. And we're basically uh, encrypting stuff back and forth to each other. And we want it to have certain properties. Uh, the two properties we typically talk about are privacy and security. Sorry, privacy and integrity. Security consists of privacy and integrity. 
but against whom? I mean, who's the, who's the bad guy here? And one of the nice things about this field is if you, have a, if you want strong enough security, you can, you're assuming a very strong adversary. And the adversary I'm assuming here is someone who has <coughs> complete control over the internet. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about securing against someone who has complete control over the internet is you don't have to understand anything about the internet. In fact, you're better off if you don't because you'll make assumptions which aren't true because the internet is whatever the bad guy wants it to be. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in order for the internet to work in the absence of a bad guy, you have to understand the internet. So the people who wrote up all these algorithms that allow you and I to talk, to do what we're doing now, talking over Zoom, etc., cetera, th that's all very, very clever and complicated stuff. But we don't have to worry about any of that because the adversary now controls the horizontal and the vertical. That's an outer limits television uh, reference. Um, the adversary controls everything. So what do we want him not to be able to do? We want him to... We want to have privacy against him and integrity against him. Privacy means he can't learn anything about mm -hmm. what we're talking about. It's more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. Integrity means he can't change what we're talking about. That is, he can't make you think I'm saying something different than I am or mm -hmm. make me think you're saying something different than you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, now some people might say, well, wait a minute. Can't he just put garbage on the line? Can't he just cut the wires? And the answer is yes. The disadvantage of, a, of hypothesizing a strong adversary is you can't stop him from doing that, but you can stop him from learning about our conversation or learning uh, or, or changing it. That is, if he cuts the wire or throws garbage, one of us will say, this is garbage, and we'll have to somehow start over. That's a separate issue, how to start over. But, but, but he shouldn't be able to break integrity or, or privacy. So and, where does this, yeah, where, where does this individual really come from? Is there always, because I'm assuming like in these days with like 7 billion people, maybe 5 billion of which are on the internet, I'm assuming every every connection, there's not really someone stooping around. So like. So it depends, of course, on how valuable a target you are. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, I don't really know how to do this. The, the The internet is not all that private. It's just wires out there and switching and people put, and also there's stuff going on right now my machine is programmed not to hear things that I'm not supposed to hear on the internet but but it very well I might there might be stuff there so so I don't know how hard it is I don't know how to do it but it's not very hard there's the minor point which it's not all people there's also squirrels chewing on wires there's also storms so when you secure against a bad person, you're also securing against nature, mm -hmm. misbehaving. Makes sense. But uh, but the fact is, there are people who can do that. If they want to, if uh, they want to listen to what you're saying, they can do it. If it's encrypted, hope well, hopefully they won't understand it. Hopefully they can change it so you'll the other person will accept it. Mm -hmm. But but people certainly can do it. And I don't think it's considered that hard. And mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent each someone's going to be bothered listening in to me. I don't think so. So I, I've sent recommendations for people over email, which is unencrypted. We generally don't feel that people are generally doing that yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they could. Uh, so uh, now uh, there are certain... If you are assuming, by the way, a really strong adversary like that, there are certain things you can't do. The adversary knows who I'm talking to. There's no way, uh, using the internet in the normal sense, that the that you can stop an adversary from knowing who you're talking to and for how long. They'll know who I'm banking with and for how long, for example. There are other ways, like the Onion Router and other things, virtual private networks, which give you some degree of anonymity. But that's not things people normally use. So... Uh, the, the only way you can get some sort of anonymity is by assuming a much more complex internet, complex in the sense that an adversary can only control part of it. And then by hypothesizing limits to how much the adversary can control, you can get some sort of anonymity. Mm. But as long as we're not concerned about that kind of security, then we can assume the adversary is completely controlling the internet. And then you get a very, very beautiful 
theory. And that's typically the assumptions that are made for the protocols I'm talking about, in particular, this secure session protocol. Mm -hmm. And the key com uh, computational complexity assumption there is about something called AES, which I don't want to get into. Uh, but uh, so that's one of the core things that's going on. And whenever, uh, when you and I have the secure conversation, now we may not do that, but here's something more complicated we might do. Uh, let's say we want to have a number of secure conversations, maybe simultaneously, maybe sequentially. How, but we only have this one key. Well, we can reuse that key for each conversation. And this is generally a terrible idea. So instead, what we do is we have another protocol, which I ca call session key agreement using a long-term key. We treat this key we've tossed when we were together. We treat that key as a, as a fixed long-term key, and we use it for each session to create a new key just for that session, hmm. also using AES. And this is also part of TLS. Sorry, I take that back. It's not part of TLS. I'll say what it is in a minute. Uh, but uh, yes. Sorry. Um, why is it that using one key for multiple conversations is bad, but using the same key to produce different keys is secure? So as far as the, f the first thing goes, I'd have to sort of give an example. Okay. Uh, it's not necessarily bad, but it's bad in many, many cases. Okay. Uh, if you think of... One, one thing you might do, for example, one simple thing I might do is called a one-time pad. I'll take some bits that I'm sending you and exclusive order them one at a time with, the, with part of the key. And that, if someone's just listening in, uh, doesn't give any information away. Exclusive order is you flip the bit or not, depending on the key bit. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you reuse a one-time pad many times, then if I know one message that's being sent, maybe because you always begin the conversation with hello, so, so therefore I know part of the message, therefore I know part of the key, and therefore if I reuse the key, I now can learn the new message. Mm -hmm. That's just a, a trivial example of why it's bad to reuse a, a long-term, uh, reuse a session key over and over again. If a key is only being used to create new session keys, then that can be done securely. But I don't think I can really explain that why without giving a particular algorithm mm -hmm. to, to do that. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really prepared to do that now. Yeah, and that would okay. be more complicated. <laughs> but, it, but in fact, mm -hmm. you can do it using the same assum AES assumptions as before. In fact, you can do that. And you can reuse this long-term key to create for each session a new session key. Okay. Now, there's a protocol for doing that. Uh, I'll tell you the name of it in a minute. The protocol we're talking about, you use the long-term key to create a new session key. And in that story I told you, remember that story, you come home, you take out your phone, you print a document, you upload down stuff from a home computer, you go to the website of the bank and you do some banking. Mm -hmm. In that whole story, you're doing the algorithm I just said. And so here's a quiz for, for both of you. Where, where, at what point in that story are you doing this algorithm? Uh, that is, two entities, two entities who share a long-term key are creating a session key to be used in the next session. Um, well, I'm said, well, it's, sorry, I was it, just going to say, I'm guessing it's between your phone and the printer uh, like in the first instance. So you're saying it, you're saying it's when I send something to the printer. Right. In the in the first so, instance. So no, it's before that. When you turn on your phone. Is the Wi-Fi? What do you what do you do which causes this algorithm to be implemented on your behalf? So remember, you come home, you take out your phone, you send something to the printer. Uh, well, it's before uh, before sending stuff to the printer. Just the so there are only two things before phone. sending something to the printer. I said you come home and you take out your phone. Right. So just taking out your phone. No, it's before no. that. <laughs> coming home. It's coming home. <laughs> what? Damn. Right? You walk so in the front door. Or maybe just before. That's when it happens. 
When your phone connects to your network? When your phone connects yeah, to your network. Yeah, when it's a okay. Wi-Fi, yeah. Yeah, so the moment your phone connects to your network, it just... And that happens while it's still in your pocket, right? Because yeah. you take out the phone and there's a, an icon on the top of your phone, mm -hmm. right? So so what are the two entities that, are, that have a long-term shared key? Your phone and the router mm -hmm. have a long-term shared key. And then when you come home, your phone is set up to connect to that network, meaning it engages in this protocol, WPA2 usually, or at least that's what it used to be. They may have updated it. And, and you exchange a session key with a router. Mm -hmm. That's using your MAC address, right? Uh, so I've left out the whole issue of what happens in the absence of an adversary. How do, how, how do you so find a router? How does a router find your phone? And the answer is MAC addresses. MAC, MAC address. stands for me media access code, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It also stands for a lot of other things. So it's a very confusing term. When I was at MIT, it was Project MAC. And even then it stood for two or three different things. <laughs> so, uh, and as... Uh, other things it stands for. But but here it's media access code, and that's how various things are identified. Uh, things the, An adversary could, of course, is out, who, has, who, who can do his own wireless stuff, can, of course, have stuff, change what's sent to the phone, change what you send <coughs> to the router, can, can change or listen to every, all of this. But... In the absence of an adversary, things are sent to the proper media access code. And that's why your phone gets something in somebody else's phone that it's not intended for. In the absence of an adversary, doesn't. So hypothetically, the adversary, I mean, he could obviously just reroute the... So yep. like, I'm downloading something and boom, it's on Parker's phone now. Kind of uh, thing. Yeah, like if we're on the only... Uh, so let's say you, you trust each other and you're both having a conversation with a router. Uh-huh. And yeah, he could do that, but Parker's phone would object. He would he would say, "Of course, that I never downloaded this. Is garbage. This. Some yeah. you know, we've lost contact and start all over again or something." Mm -hmm. I mean, the, there are a lot of security protocols, especially these days. I think with a lot of this stuff, but I'm assuming, especially in the in the days starting, this would have been a very big problem, right? Like security, like especially sending con like uh, confidential information over and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't really know how the uh, uh, WPA2 and TLS are two buzzwords for this. I don't know how that all really got started, and they and there's still problems with at least some of them uh, because they're trying to do a lot of different things for a lot of different people. They're trying to make a lot of people happy. Well, let's do this, and let's do that, let's do that, and, and it's definitely problematic, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but yeah, I don't, all that took some time for all that that stuff to be developed. So you come into the house and you now have a shared uh, session key with the router. And all the other encryption you're doing, like to the bank, your phone is encrypting stuff to the bank. We'll talk about that in a second. But it's also the stuff that's encrypted to the bank is there's another layer of encryption whereupon that's encrypted to the router. Right? Because you're having a session with the bank via the router. The router session to the router is encrypting everything you're sending. So it's so there's a layer of encryption back and forth between you and the router, which includes stuff which is encrypted between you and other and the bank. Mm -hmm. I mean it's there's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. So that's two protocols I've talked about, the uh, session protocol and the one that changes the session key given the long-term shared key. And by the way, just so your audience re recalls, how does your phone share a long-term key with the router? Just by so, connecting, right? No, the long-term key. That's how oh, they the share the session key. key. How did they, remember they share a lot, uh, to be, we're beginning before I, or be, before mm -hmm. I started the story, mm -hmm. your phone shares a long-term key with the router. How did that happen? When you initially set up, went into your settings and... Yeah, in the, in the most uh, dumb way possible, a human being chose a key, went to the router, entered it. That human being or his friend went to your phone and entered it mm -hmm. into the appropriate software. All right, so this was done. This is a very, very low-tech thing. Yeah. It was all done by some person, some guy, going between the two devices. Mm -hmm. So just... So people understand that this this is a very trivial matter. Mm -hmm. Now you have to know how the software works for both of those things, but 
but it's just very, very, very labor intensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to all of our listeners right now, if you've made it this far into the episode, clearly you are interested in cryptography, computer science and math in general. And so for you guys, obviously, this is a podcast, this is audio. Um, but if you actually want to go and learn more about these topics more in depth, we recommend to you brilliant.org. So in, in the context of this, of this episode today, they have lessons on cryptographic functions, applications of cryptography. And these lessons are very uh, interactive. And so it's not just, you know, reading, a scr reading your screen and then, you know, you move on with your life, right? They ask you questions as you're learning. And so you can actually put that knowledge into application. Mm -hmm. And for those of you out there that uh, are super intrigued by all of these cool courses, you can click the link in the description below and somewhere in the comment section brilliant.org forward slash mpp or as i mentioned that link in the description below and that first 200 people that sign up get a clean 20 percent off their premium subscription into brilliant so go sign up really quick uh as mentioned as parker just mentioned their interactive courses took a whole new leap in the last couple months so they've added a bunch of new stuff so it's really cool go check them out yeah. So, Dr. Rakoff, you mentioned that um, the first two protocols, um, and you said that there were three yeah. that you wanted to um, <clears throat> mention so th there. The third one has to do with the bank. Uh, you do not have a long-term shared key with the bank. You do have a password, which is not viewed as being ter terribly secure, mm -hmm. because you can memorize it, hopefully. <clears throat> and you do not have a long-term shared key with your bank. And you can imagine an alternative way of doing life in which you would, but that's not how it's done. So what is done is as follows. So I'll tell you now how you do banking. I'm going to act as if you're on a desktop, wire desktop doing banking. But actually, if it's being done by your phone, then everything I'm describing is being encrypted in the session you have with the router including the stuff that's been encrypted to the bank. Mm. But let's omit talking, let's forget about that layer of encryption involving between you and the router, just talk about the bank and the internet. So you want to share, you want to obtain a session key to be used for your session with the bank. Well, based on what? You don't have a long-term shared key. The only thing you have is the bank has a public key. Hmm. Uh, now, and you have nothing. And, and using the bank's public key and you're nothing, you want to do this. I find this, ex well, first of all, let's talk about where the public key is. It's in your computer somehow. Let's not go into the details. For a, a well-known bank, you're, you're, uh, you go to the website of the bank and you better be, have the right website and not a website with, which looks similar, but it's not. Mm -hmm. You have the website, it begins with HTTPS, and the, your computer will automatically know or obtain the public key of this institution. And we'll, we'll talk about how that's done. And now, using that, you and the bank want to cryptographically talk to each other in such a way that you wind up sharing a session key, even though you're nobody. Now, I find this very, very counterintuitive. How... How can, a pair, how can the bank share a key with someone who isn't anyone? You're, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, apparently, we have something that works. The definitions that exist are quite poor for this. But this is done all the time. Every time you go to a secure website, you're nobody. All you do is you know the website's uh, public key. And then you do this algorithm, which uh, I'll call session key agreement, where one party has public key credentials which is also part of TLS. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, if you want to look up these algorithms, you can, but you have to spend a lot of time. They're very hard to find, and I think you have to pay money. It, 
they're really trying to keep all this stuff secret from everyone except the bad guys. That that's the, seems to be the philosophy of, of the people who manage Internet security. Let's make sure good guys have a lot of trouble finding out what we're doing and pay a lot of money. But the bad guys, they'll find out whatever they want. So cryptography uh, professors are to be protected is what you're saying. Uh, it, they it's hold not, a lot of knowledge. <laughs> the... the, the uh, it's it's all very badly written up, I think. Anyway, uh, so that's the, so there's this protocol I think unintuitive, which shares a key, a session key between someone with a public key and the other person who has no no credentials at all, except you know the bank's public key, and so you engage in this protocol, and that protocol involves public key encryption and perhaps public key signatures, <clears throat> and uh, and maybe also AES, but that's, I'm not sure if that's involved in that at all or not. But in any case, it involves these public key things, which are different from what was involved in the previous two protocols I spoke of. And as a result, we now have a shared session key. What do we do with that shared session? Well, we now have this session. How does the session typically begin with a bank? The bank says, what's your login name and password? And you give your login name and password. Remember, that's being encrypted over the secure channel, which mm -hmm. is also being encrypted between you uh, above that and another layer between you and the router, mm -hmm. which I promised I wouldn't talk about, but I did. Uh, so, so that's how a session with a bank would usually begin. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting. What happens if, if you don't have... Uh, okay, so I guess that's all I wanted to say about that protocol. Uh, and or, and once, once you've exchanged a session key, then you have the secure session with the bank. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it, it seems sort of insecure if your password isn't so, so secure. Hopefully, if you get it wrong three times in a row, your bank will say, we're, we're not doing, doing business with you anymore unless you, I don't know, come to our office or answer your email or something or other. Mm -hmm. right. One of the biggest problems, I think, in all of these security protocols is Everybody is acknowledged makes mistakes. You will forget your password. You will forget this. You will forget this. You want to get it back somehow. They'll say, okay, what was your first grade teacher's name? Or what was the name of your first pet? Mm -hmm. Or your first mm -hmm. girlfriend? And then, of course, your first girlfriend can now ident identify herself as you because she knows it was her. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's recovering from error of one sort or another is... A, a real problem, I think, in all cryptographic protocols. Uh, and and you know, you have this system working, but you've forgotten something. They say, okay, don't worry about it. I'll give you a new password or something. And you've all, we've, we've all been part of that. And right. it, it just all seems, does this, is this really good? <laughs> and you might think, well, it works in practice. On the other hand, uh, you were talking to me earlier about AT&T losing 70 million <laughs> Bit, uh, information about 70 million customers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So something's going wrong somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot is going wrong in a lot of places. Right. Yeah. My, um, my own consolation is it's sort of a good thing that they're not personally attacking me because I'm, I'm no longer important enough. Why attack me if you can attack AT&T? And as long as AT&T doesn't lose my account, then I'm okay. Um, but uh, there's certainly a lot wrong in various aspects with the way things work in practice. On, on, most of the time, they kind of sort of work, and then occasionally there are colossal failures, seems to be. And occasionally mm -hmm. isn't that infrequent. Yeah. We, we didn't discuss this before we started recording, but would you be okay with speaking about blockchain technology? Uh, I'd rather not. I don't okay. understand it very well. Let me just briefly say sure. I'm rather a skeptic that it has much in the way of use, but that may be because I don't understand enough about finance. Okay. No, just because when talk, you were... Who, who understand finance, say, oh, it's very important for finance. I don't understand anything about finance, but I don't quite see why it should be useful. Right. It's just because when you were talking about public keys, um, I know when you do like transactions between wallets and things like that, you use public keys and private keys and things like, um, sorry, things like that. So... Yeah, just wondering. So every public key is associated with a private key. Mm -hmm. That the person, <clears throat> if a public key is associated with you, you have a private key, which allows you to do stuff. 
And if that private key gets out, it's bad for you. Yeah. Or if you lose your private key, it's bad for you. And you hear about this happening. People, <laughs> what is it, uh, 256 bits or something like that? You lose 256 bits and all your money's gone. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. I yeah. wanted to talk about... You, you can't go like to the bank and the, say, please give it back to me. It's just, it's just gone. It's sad, but I wanted to talk about the level of security on a lot of these accounts. So you were talking about like uh, some bit. So, you know, like end bit encryption, right? Now we know uh, like a lot of a lot of these new security change are 256 bit encryption. That's the highest level stuff like like what? 128 bit encryption like you want to maybe explain a little bit on well what does that really well, mean I, I, the higher bit encryption bit. and the uh, difference between the security levels I, I, i'll explain what it means there probably is no difference in practice in the security levels <clears throat> and 128 bits may be even more secure than 256 bits uh i'll, I'll say why in a minute but uh when people talk about breaking something they are not breaking one of those algorithms we're talking about that the person who broke into AT&T did not say, well, it was only 128 bits. If it was 256 bits, I wouldn't have been able to. It's not that at all. Mm, it's just guessing. AES, the Advanced Encryption System, uh, what is it? Basically, it's three things because there are three versions of it. Some people call them uh, block ciphers. They're not. That doesn't mean anything. They can be used as ciphers. They can be used as anything you want to use them as. They can be used as ciphers. But the point is they're functions. They're three functions. And each function has two parts, uh, a part which we call a key and a part which we call an input and a part which we call an output. And the input and output are always 128 bits long. The key varies in there. I said there are three parts. In one version of AES, not three parts, three versions. In one version, the key is 128 bits long. In another version, the key is, I think, 192 bits long. Is that between 128 and 256? And in the third version, it's 256 bits long. Mm -hmm. uh, in each version, the key denotes a function mapping 128 bits to 128 bits. Okay. And the function is keyed with 128 bits or 192 bits or 256 bits. And, and there are three different functions. And there's no re whatever your notion is of good, bet, better, or worse, there's no provable reason to believe the 256 bit version is better than the 128 bit version. It just people think it is, mm -hmm. at least in theory. In practice, it probably doesn't make any difference assuming you're using them in the correct way. And AES must must be used in the correct way. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's an assumption about AES, which is that we assume it's pseudo-random, which means, briefly, that if you don't know the key and you just see the, f the function, you have access to the function, it looks like a random function. More, we could call it a random permutation. I don't want to get into the difference right now. Let's just say if you if you have access to the function, it looks like a random function. You can't tell it apart if mm -hmm. if you don't see a key. And uh, and so I think when they talk about two fifty six versus one twenty eight, they're saying we use we use this version of AES, which stands for Advanced Encryption System. We use this version of AES. We use the two fifty six bit version of AES rather than the one twenty eight or one ninety two bit version of AES. Mm -hmm. So is AES. Um, kind of like a one-way function where... Uh, you can use it to get a one-way function. Okay, okay. Yeah, and just uh, to and explain you... for, the, for the listeners, a one-way function, it, it's... Uh, the, the, you mentioned this earlier, like the SHA-2 SHA function, I think that's what well, it's well, called. Well, you have to be careful in talking about the SHA things being one-way function because uh, it's not clear that those are one way or not. I mean, okay. people want a lot of things from the hash function, from these SHA things. Mm -hmm. They want lots and lots of features, and it's not clear what exact features you want from them. So, so I'd rather not talk about that right now. Sure, a one-way yeah. function is just a function which is easy to compute and hard on average to invert. Mm -hmm. So uh, an example of a use of a one-way function is uh, you have a password. Let's say it's a long password. Uh, but that I mean it's really secure uh, with an organization. 
and to log in, you'd give them this password over some secure session. And the trouble is, they don't want to store your passwords because they're afraid that someone may break into their computer when they're shut down and steal them. Or maybe there's some file which some employee could steal and send off. So what they actually want to record is a one-way function of your password. Let's call it F. They store F of your password. Then you log in and give your password. They don't look up the password you give. They take F of that and they look that up and make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. And so now an adversary, he, if he does have access to this file <clears throat> of not passwords anymore, but F applied to the passwords, if an adversary does have access to that, let's say he sees F of your password, to log in as you, he doesn't need to know your password. He needs to know something that F maps to the same thing that your password maps to. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's just guesswork, right? Well, one would hope. One would hope he cannot do that. Mm -hmm. That is, he, he, he knows F of your password. He can't find something which maps to the same thing if your password was chosen as a random long string. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want one-way functions. You can get a one-way function from AES, but you have to be careful doing it. So, for example, if you take the 128-bit version of AES, so it, uh, and as I said, this determines a function for mapping 128 bits to 128 bits. Let's call that AES sub K. Then the function that maps K, let's assume AES has this pseudo-random property I mentioned. So the function which maps k to aes sub k of, say, 0 is provably a one-way function. And that's not at all obvious. So you map k to aes sub k of 0. And that's a one-way function. But you have to be very careful. Let's say you use a 256 version, bit version of aes. So now your password is a 256 bits long. The function which maps k to aes sub k of 0 may not be a one-way function. We cannot prove that that's a one-way function at all. It would be very, very dangerous to use that. Mm -hmm. So you really have to know what you're doing when you use aes. It turns out that when your uh, key, when your password is much longer than its image under f, you're in potential trouble. And for 256-bit, your password is 256 bits long, but your image is 128 bits long. <clears throat> and you might be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. if you but this that. doesn't happen when it's 128 mapping right. to 128. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a theorem which says that. And also, but, it's, but So what you could do if you want to use a 256-bit version, you map k, the 256-bit k, to aes sub k of 0 concatenated with aes sub k of 1, for example. And then that would be OK. So you have to make the image match the length of your password. Yeah. But this is a thing. I, I like talking about this because I feel it's a, a thing a lot of practical people probably don't know. And mm -hmm. you can get into a lot of trouble if you do that wrong. People don't even really think about any of this, really, to be honest. Like, you know, they don't think about, you know, how security works and how or the lack of security with a lot of these protocols, with a lot of these... Uh, companies, you know, giving our data to them and stuff like that. And I know before we started this conversation, we were talking a little bit about, you know, privacy and security and, you know, this whole, this whole situation, I guess, right now with everything happening, you know, like we're moving to a world where almost every single app on our phone knows more about us than we do about ourselves. Right. So like, what's your take on the whole, on the whole privacy matter and like where we're basically giving all our data to these big corps. Like so, so one suggestion I have if you're concerned about privacy <clears throat> is make sure you uh, use a Google phone. Okay. Because Google already knows everything about you. <laughs> right? So nice you, can't, yeah. you cannot lose privacy to your phone. I mean, that's an important... You go with some upstart company like... Uh, uh, 
Sony or something. That well, it's, well, not really up there, but like I, I know what you mean, like One Plus or something like that, like the Huawei, like like the new ones coming up. I guess Huawei is also pretty. They have big. a lot to learn about you. Yeah, 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 that's true. But but Google knows everything it wants to know about you. Mm-hmm. So I would so say stick, stick with the big guns. Basically. Stick with stick with the mafia, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's that's one easy suggestion. Uh, uh, as far as privacy goes, I think it's a big issue. I, I'm more concerned about people not just learning about me, but for one, either because of learning about me or f- through some other reason, being able to impersonate me. And identity theft is, is I think, the, the scariest thing. Mm-hmm. There's a, you read stories about this happened, this one woman, somebody uh, declared themselves to be her and sold her house to wow. somebody else who then sold it to the bank. And then the bank told her, we own this house, you have to get out. The bank behaved abominably in this case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the bank clearly should never sold her house. It's clear that the bank, therefore, they bought property that from somebody who had bought stolen property. And the and if you buy stolen property from someone who bought stolen property, you you lose. Yeah, you forfeit the bank, but the bank fought it for years in the courts, and eventually, I don't know why they didn't just give up because they were just clearly in the wrong. Anyway, they eventually did lose, and she got her house back. But mm. but this is the kind of thing I, I worry about more. One thing I worry about least of all in terms of privacy is medical privacy. It's and it's an astounding thing that people view medical privacy as one of the most important forms of privacy, whereas it's clearly one of the least important forms of privacy. People walk around with, with uh, bracelets on, like I have one on, about all their health problems. I mean, uh, you, you want people to know generally about your health problems. Uh, you really uh, can't really keep health problems a secret. And if you have serious health problems, you probably don't want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, what bugs the hell out of me about our health care system is you go, some, you go someplace and they don't know anything about you typically. You go to emergency, and and they want your life story. You may mm-hmm. not even speak English. If you do, you may be senile, the, or the person who's helping you doesn't know your life story. They they come saying, "Here's the drugs he's taking." I've seen this, and and there's a big bag of drugs, and they look at the drugs you're taking, and they know nothing about you. And you have doctors treating you who have no. You're not in the system at all. They have no records about you at all, and and. They know nothing about you. Whenever people say we really need medicalized records, good records, good medical records, people say, oh, there's a real security problem here. There's a real privacy problem. Not really. Yeah, mm-hmm. people may find out your medical condition, which is what you really want if you have a serious medical condition. You right. want mm-hmm. people to find uh, – we had a friend who was in the hospital. With a, he, had, he needed brain surgery because he hit his head. And uh, subdural hematoma is what it's called. The lining of the brain is bleeding. They needed some information about previous heart surgery he had. They had taken a vein from some arm. They wanted to know what arm. And they couldn't find that out. And his daughter suggested, why not call the hospital? So this hospital said, no, that's a good idea. They'd never thought of that before. So this hospital called that hospital and was actually got the information they need. I mean, we have much too much privacy about health care in our system. Hmm. Uh, It's it's absurd how much privacy there is. You'll die because of it, but people will have no idea why. So I guess you should die a happy man. Uh, so yes, I think privacy is important. Uh, I don't like what Google and Facebook and all those people are doing all the time. Uh, and I I don't like the fact that the uh, government seems to be sort of spying or having the ability to spy on everybody all the time. I think that gives them much more power than they should have. They should have some power, but not that much. But I am con- concerned about privacy. I'm just saying it's not necessarily at the top of my my list. Mm-hmm. And as I said, I deal with it by having a Google phone. Right, right. you're not spreading out your information, yeah. <laughs> keeping it in one place. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and well, they can be trusted not to, hopefully they won't lose it. They may sell it. Hopefully they're smart enough not to lose it. Yeah. Well... Awesome. Is there anything else, Ray, you wanted to... Uh, just trying to think. Uh, I think I basically got all my questions out. I just wanted to really... I just wanted a good... Like, just a general understanding of cryptography, really. 
And so what I what I didn't talk about was any of the al- any of the alg- any of these three algorithms, or mm-hmm. what they how they actually behave. Your question is how can you use a long term key over and over and over again without somehow having that key uh, dissipate, be no good anymore? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, one way of looking at it is if it's an AES key, if you uh, Eval- say K, if you evaluate A, S of K on different things every time, then you're somehow not losing anything about K. Right. So that's a simple way of seeing maybe it's possible to use a long-term key to uh, over and over again to mm-hmm. acquire new short-term session keys. Right, I get that. Well, awesome. I guess though. We we did get like a a nice gist of cryptography and and some of the useful protocols that we use on a daily basis. I really enjoyed the little anecdote of coming home and using your phone and all that. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It was a very interesting episode. Uh, Ray, anything you want to mention? I mean, it was awesome having you on. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we I still remember that episode when we originally mentioned we need to have a cryptographer on to at least get a little understanding about oh, what is the art of cryptography. And I mean, it is a very it is a very special mathematical field, you know, that can definitely prove to be useful. And yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully we do this again. Maybe get even deeper into the actual cryptography stuff like that maybe sure. deeper into the algorithms we always have time so okay. i just wanted to thank you so much for coming you're on welcome. it was awesome having you on here and mm-hmm. yeah any if, news anything if you're else? if you're listening Good to job. this episode right now remember to hit the follow button wherever you're listening to this podcast also come see the video version on youtube where you can come subscribe like the video and all that stuff um, yeah, a lot yeah. of Spotify listeners email like not a lot, but we got like three emails like this like last week, or comments being like, "Oh, I'm a Spotify listener. Didn't know you're on YouTube." Yeah, mention like every episode. Come see us. So yeah, this has been <laughs> yeah. episode number seventy-five of the Math and Physics podcast. I'm your host Parker, and I'm Ray, and we will see you soon. Bye, guys.